thanks to Bob from ABD Geopolitical News. What does she say at the centenary of the CPC? He says she wants China bullies of bloodshed. President gives a defiant speech to mark CPC centenary. Now the question is, a confident country doesn't need to give a threat like this. It, this basically, essentially, folks, shows you nervousness. Nervousness it, in a large, to a large extreme. Right? Why China is doing this is because it knows that the image that the globe it, it has created is an exaggerated image, whether it's about its technology, whether it's about its wealth, whether it's about its foreign exchange reserves, whether it's about its uh, economic growth. And this, in this particular exaggerated image, folks, the people who are the most to blame are the Western media, which includes the Financial Times, the New York Times, Economist, and Wall Street Journal. Right. It also includes banks. It includes especially German banks, British banks, the Wall Street banks. You know, but now the winds are changing, as you can see with the scrolling down on my side about the way the media suddenly turned against China. So it's going to have a huge problem going forward. You've got tensions with Australia. Manufacturing prices are skyrocketing, rocketing fastest growth in 13 years. There's a expanded high tech security uh, 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 scrutiny on high tech companies, which is going to have a problem. Yuan is set for a problem with it with the United States as it strengthens, breaks, no, key, breaks on Xi's green development as costs rise. Jobs and jabs are ineffective. Internally also what you're finding is that they're having to mix and match because the effectiveness is not there. And as you've already seen in Bahrain and Seychelles and, and in Mongolia, ramping COVID even despite these jabs. Folks, more later. The key, folks, is the comparison is not India and China. I gotta forget about that, right? We understand, we acknowledge. There's a huge national gap, there's a huge gap in the economy. But the issue is, the, what about, the competition is the United States and China. It's the US way ahead of China. Well, not way ahead, but at least 10 years ahead. In technology, in, 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 in terms of intellect property, in terms of finances, in terms of the companies that are far richer, in terms of per capita income. It's not about GDP at the end of the day. GDP at the end of the day, China now has been reduced to a middle income group. It's completely reliant on exports and the exports to these countries are getting nailed as they go along. Why are they the, what is important to know is the United States and the Western world and Japan enjoy a huge edge over technology. And in technology, with this new squeeze that's come from the United States, very specific, the guys now who are handling these sanctions are, just remember, I forget their names, but they are specialists at targeted sanctions. And they're hurting Russia and they're hurting China where it hurts. They are squeezing, squeezing the heat, right? And that's going to have a deleterious effect on China, its people, its society, and its economy going into the long run. China just, if you see, now look at look about this technology, they keep throwing things in the air, going things up, and this friend of mine, they throw things in the Mars, they've got great technology. Hey, but let me tell you about technology. Do you remember the CNN, the first war that was fought on television, and what we said about the United States, great technology, you know, all these buddies, sky busters, these, these, these great drones, everything. I mean, look at, that's the way Hollywood and the United States projecting its power. But now let me ask you folks. Let's look at history. What's happened to the United States and Iraq? Left with its left as has had to vacate, did not win that war. What happened to now the latest in Afghanistan? Again couldn't win it. So folks, Chinese technology, which is in my opinion, is close to junk if you compare it to the United States. It's a it's a as a, as an analyst said it, it's a castle built on sand because the fundamentals of technology they don't have. They don't have. Folks, how many of you guys who keep thinking and reading papers think that their jet engines are the best? They still have not been able to fly, fly an effective commercial airliner because they don't have the goddamn engines. They're relying on engines from the stupid Russians who don't give them the technology. And, 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 and that's where they are. They keep trying to reverse engineer Russian technology, which they've been fairly unsuccessful at doing. Acknowledging this gap national gap, economic gap. Let me just tell you and put your minds to rest, folks. The military gap, as Kanti Bajpai, who again is not a very, you know, uh, you can sense there is a bias towards uh, China generally in the past, or a bias towards socialism. So hence, he used to always, you know, till they, we got hammered in Doklam, is that's when a lot of socialists came out of their woodwork and started, you know, becoming anti-China. 
he, he also acknowledges the fact that the military power differential, and as Karan Thapar has said it in his article, is far less. India can hold its own. So, folks, don't you worry. That's one place China understands after Doklam that it's not about technology. But India has to up its game. It needs all these necessary alliances that we are building. The sum of these alliances, folks, is far, far greater than what China can throw at us. Then a lot of you will come out and a lot of analysts will come out. Yeah, but you will, you're all alone and they will not fight for you. But do remember, it's not the fighting. It's the support. It's the technology support. It's the equipment support. It's, 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 it's intelligence support. It's information support. But more importantly, it's the pressure that builds on the South China Sea from these alliances that forces China to, to, to divide its effort. That, folks, in the end of the day, is really the key. And why do you think that, you know, the people who were on China's side, you think, look at what the United States has done. $250 billion it's thrown at technology and bringing the critical, critical supply chains to trusted partners and to it. Can China do that? No. Do they have $250 billion? A lot of you will say, oh, they've got the largest reserve. Hey, but those reserves, it's a balance sheet. The other side of it is a humongous amount of debt. They don't have free money as everybody thinks. They are not going to be able to throw this $250 billion. They are throwing a lot of money, but at the end of the day, the machines that make the chips, the people who make the machines, the software who runs the machines is not with them. And then coming to the other fact, is your is your uh, uh, is your uh, 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 your other essential things that the other another friend of mine was talking about? Yeah, but they control EVs. EVs depends on batteries. Batteries, folks, depends on lithium. And lithium, they don't have. If you think they're lithium, and lithium, for, by the for all the uninitiated, is that's not the same thing as rare metals. Now a little bit on rare metals. Rare metals is a technology that was developed in the United States by a company in Colorado many, many years even before China smelt it. Why did that? Why did and and the U.S. has sufficient reserves to take care of its own requirements? So does Australia. So does India. So does uh, so does a number of other places. Why you ask yourself? Why is China running after rare material, rare, uh, rare, rare metal resources if they all had it at home? They have just lost a plot in Greenland. If people who've been reading. The reason that they're running after is because their own resources are not sufficient. Look at your geography, folks. What China did was to set up the processing plants. Why didn't India, the United States, all lose the plot in processing? Because it's highly polluted. Highly polluting and in highly regulated uh, environmental, environmental countries like the United States, it became just too expensive to process rare metal. But let me believe you me, if people who are not reading it, there are two companies that have now been given, the original company used to do rare metal, has been given contracts by the United States and a company in Canada. They will be provided the, 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 the bandwidth of price differentials and the sourcing of rare metals will come from there. So folks, in four to five years, you'll find the control of China also in rare metals, boom, on the side, yum. And China knows that. Secondly, India has sufficient reserves of rare metals for its own requirements on the beaches of Kerala and in Odisha. And if for the people who don't know, we have a rare metal corporation. Our problem, again, is the technology for processing. And it's not going to come from China. Japan has offered it to us. United States has offered it to us. The problem for India was and continues to be is the bureaucracy in our, in our, in our different departments that will not allow... This, 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 these plants to come up in pristine areas like Odessa and Kerala, rightly so, because they're going to have to spend the money on ensuring that all environmental, all environmental protocols are maintained, and these are expensive. But if India wants to help, India can compete with China absolutely with the help of Japan and and, and Japan and uh, the United States and Australia on. So, folks. All those who think that there's a huge differential that can't be, and that the gap can't be widened, that not is that is not what is important. What is important is the fact that technology is not what wins wars. They've controlled their population with ruthlessness and brooked absolutely no dissent. However, I think they've got caught in a trap of their own making. If you start the whole process with Mao, you see the entire history is is driven by the blood of its own citizens, whether it was the Great Leap or subsequently the famine, a famine forced onto the people by Mao's 
industrial policy where steel was made the focus. And now she, and it's whether it's the Uyghur, so they've got, they've got a couple of problems. One, they've got a population that's the uh, incremental rate of population now uh, will lead to a, a situation where there are no young people, any, any incentivization to try and create more children. Now the women are uh, totally against it. Uh, and as a result of which, that uh, as a result of which, that is uh, that is something that will have a huge problem in their economic growth going in the future. By coming out this early, they basically have got caught in a in a in a, a middle income trap because their entire future really actually depends on on global exports and global markets. And with those now those and now the global winds completely against them. The easy money, the easy theft of technology, the easy theft of, uh, of, of, of prototypes is now dissipated. Now they really actually have to work hard. You know, a lot of people think that they, they, they had these brains that came out of some middle kingdom. It's not the same thing. It's like us. We had all the brains apparently as per our guys from the Vedas, but that didn't help us. Here the issue was the single-minded focus on whether it was theft of intellect, theft of intellectual property, a buyout of, of intellectuals, and that's where they were fairly successful. And now, unfortunately, with the blowback from the West, they're going to find the going extremely tough. So if they get caught in this middle-income trap, they're going to get caught in, in that middle-income trap for a fairly, fairly long time. Crazy juxtaposition while uh, 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 the uh, CPC is uh, celebrating its uh, going ha ha ho ho or kung ho about its uh, centenary. Here we have Milestone Galwan. Carefully constructed India China relations have been appended. LSEV Sri Lanka continues to be source of concern. What does it say? It says all this means the LSE in Eastern Ladakh continues to be a source of concern for India. After the Galwan clash, Delhi hit back by cutting off some. Chinese investments in Indian businesses and restrict imports to reduce dependence on Chinese goods. As the only country in the Quad that shares a border with China, India needs to be prepared to contend with a more belligerent Beijing from the NAC to the Indian Ocean. Rightfully, Galwan, one year later, there is greater strategic clarity about China, but tactical ambiguity doesn't help. True, India watchful as China conducts air exercises. India-China agree to hold another meeting. India-China agree to soon hold military talks for early resolution. Nothing happening, folks. Seeing the Sino-Indian talks to end disengagement in past this week, not going to happen. CPC is working, man. LAC deployment meant to foil Indian land grab. This is what China is selling its, uh, its public. China disturbed peace in border areas. Government acts back. MEA hits back. Blames China for standoff. LAC deployment at defensive arrangement, says Beijing. China realizes its LAC troops require better training, CDS says. China encroachment in Bhutan could be a headache for India. Focus on Pak rather than China, India and Tier 3 as cyber power says report. That is stupid. And what is important here is what I was talking about. The roots of the India-China accord. Today, we've reached the apogee of the trajectory. Clearly, China does not see India as a fellow great power, writes Bajpai. And therefore, from a position of strength, China does not see the need to accommodate India. The opposite applies to India. From a position of weakness, India feels it cannot afford to accommodate China without loss of standing and strategic autonomy. Then he says, this is the important part. We know only too well of the economic gap when I had, what I hadn't realized that compared to the enormous disparities in economic strength, India and China are not as far as part in military strength. That was a pleasant surprise indeed. Bajpai adds, a, given the stopping power of the Himalaya and the maritime distances, the imbalances is less daunting. Yet much of this, Bajpai argues, is checked by geography and strategy. That is why China's ability to coerce or defeat India appears limited. Third, nuclear weapons, just as India has escalation dominance over Pakistan, so China has the advantage over us. Fourth, cyber automated and remotely operated devices married to artificial intelligence. Bajpai says the Chinese military is ahead on all counts, but just about it. Right? The lesser a good bet, there will be more Ladakhs. He also fears problems and are natural, strategically more important because it's rich in resources. The greater is more disturbing. China's comprehensive national power is about seven times that of India. And until India substantially closes the power gap, there is little prospect of a lasting rapprochement. Finally, is that likely? Like I said, with all the necessary alliances, it is more than possible, folks. Jai Hind.